Hello and welcome to this first of six webinars in the Cultural Blueprinting Toolkit. I'm Joe Tai and I will be your coach, your consultant, and your guide in creating a blueprint for what we call the invisible architecture of your organization. Um, and just like you need to have a detailed blueprint for the physical buildings, what I'm challenging you to do is to create a blueprint, create a plan for that invisible architecture, what we call the blueprint behind the blueprint. And that's the subject of the second webinar. But very briefly, we use a construction metaphor to help you create that blueprint. And the foundation is core values both personal core values of the people who work with you and the stated and implicit core values of the organization itself. And then this, on that foundation of values, we build the superstructure of corporate culture. That's the personality. That's the character of your organization. That's what it feels like to work there, what it feels like to be a customer, to be a client, to be a patient. And then, continuing the construction metaphor, we, co we come in and in a building, we lay down carpet, we put up wallpaper. That is the emotional attitude in your workplace. And that's the structure, that's the format that we will be using uh, to help you create that invisible architecture, the blueprint for your invisible architecture in your organization. Now, if you have any questions as we go along over the next six weeks, six months, whatever time frame you use for rolling out this uh, this. Uh, toolkit, feel free to contact me. There's my email address. If you're a subscriber to the Values Advisor Consulting Service, um, you will also participate in our monthly teleconferences, get that special newsletter, and be able to call me anytime you need help. Let me, let me start by t telling you a little bit about our mission at Values Coach. And it is in two parts. The first part is transforming people through the power of values. And I found this picture that really captures what we do. <laughs> and what a great image, right? A tabby cat looking in the mirror, and there is a lion looking back at him. And tell me, if you could get up every morning, you yourself could get up every morning, look in the mirror, and not just see who's really there, or worse yet, pretend to see uh, less than who's really there. But what if you could look in the mirror and see who you could be if you were really being your best self? Who could you be if you weren't letting fear hold you back from doing the things you know you have to do. Who could you be if you were not listening to that toxic voice of negativity telling you you're not good enough, you're not pretty enough, you're not smart enough, rich enough, you don't deserve it, whatever. Who could you be if you were really living your values every day? And no matter who you are or where you are, there's always a gap, isn't there? There's always a gap between the ideal and who you are. And the challenge in life is to close that gap. And then our, the second part of our mission is transforming organizations through the power of those empowered people. And here's one way we do that. Uh, one of the tools we use is the self-empowerment pledge. And we'll get to that. It's in the toolkit workbook that you have now. And we'll get to that in a future webinar. But we're seeing all across the country, we're seeing groups of people come together in the main lobby of their organization, in, in staff meetings, in patient care unit huddles, and sharing as a group that day's promise from the Self-Empowerment Pledge. And, and those are some of the tools that we use. And this toolkit will be full of tools that, at two levels. One is helping you personally and helping you help your coworkers personally be better people, manage their time and their money more effectively, more effectively achieve their own goals and become the people they're meant to be. And in an organizational level, help you develop that culture built on those values that help you be the organization you could be. And that gets to this power of culture that we're going to be talking about today. I'm going to show you two pictures here, restaurants. Which one of the two is more likely to earn the undying loyalty and, and, and passion and word of mouth of a clientele of raving fans? This one or this one? 
And you probably know this. This is te Texas Roadhouse Restaurant. One time I was talking to the senior HR guy at Texas Roadhouse, and what he told me is, we know the only way to, con to create a sustainable competitive distinction against people like Outback and Lone Star. I mean, we all serve great food. We all provide great service. But we know what really matters to our customers is if they have fun. And the only way we can make sure our customers have fun is to make sure our employees are having fun, as is happening in this picture. That is culture. That is the difference between a diner that will never grow and Texas Roadhouse Restaurant, the fastest growing steakhouse chain in America. And it's moving from or to and. Texas Roadhouse knows we have to have great food, and we have to have great service, and we have to be effective and efficient and, and, be, and provide good prices, and we need to have fun and make sure that our customers are having fun. And I, there, there are no studies documenting this, but I'm quite sure if there were, it would show your bottom line of next year is determined by your strategies, but your bottom line of two and three and four years from now is much more influenced by your culture than by the strategic directions that you're taking. And here's what we're going to cover in the next 60 minutes. Number one, to understand what employee engagement really is and why it is so important to you. Number two, to review the essential elements required to have a culture of ownership and that relationship between that kind of culture and an engaged workforce. And then some of the key lessons that we have learned for building a culture of ownership on that foundation of values. And I am also going to make three assumptions. <laughs> and to assume, to save time, let's assume that I know what I'm talking about. Number one, I am going to assume, this is really important, I'm going to assume that you really do want to have a culture of ownership where people feel empowered to do the right thing. If you're a control freak, if you want to make all the decisions, if, if it frightens you to hear the word empowerment, you're probably not going to get a whole lot out of this toolkit. Second assumption I'm going to make is you don't want another program that's going to come and go, a program of the month, the flavor of the month, that you really do want to change your organization, and that takes a movement. And I'm going to encourage you to watch a video, and it's, there's a link in the toolkit uh, in the workbook you have, the, the three-minute TED video, How to Start a Movement, and understand the role of the lone nut, and understand the role of the first follower, and understand how you've got to create momentum. And the third assumption I'm going to make is that you don't see this just as a way to increase the bottom line, increase productivity, increase customer or patient satisfaction as another program, but rather you're looking at this toolkit as an investment in your people and an investment in your organization. So before we get started, let's take a little river trip. Let's imagine that we are with Outward Bound and we've been out on the river all morning. It's been a lovely day. We stop for lunch at this white sandy beach and our guide's coming around asking us how we're doing. Oh, we're having a great time. This is so much fun. And our guide says, well, don't get too complacent because we have an adventure coming up for you. We get back out on the river. The water gets rougher and rougher. And we, and we suddenly drop down into this maelstrom of white water. And our guide in the back of the boat there hollers out, hang on, folks, this is it. The class five rapids I've been telling you about all day long. Everybody grab a paddle, dig in, and paddle for your life. And that guy in the middle in the pink helmet says, I don't paddle. That's not my job. What do you do? That's right. You throw them out of the boat. When you are in class five rapids, it doesn't matter what your name tag says. It doesn't matter what your job title is. Everybody picks up a paddle and digs in because you're in chaos. And it's fascinating how many writers have, have clicked onto this theme of chaos and it's become a business in itself. People writing books about how to survive, how to thrive, how to conquer, how to learn from chaos. Chaos is beautiful when you see it from a distance, isn't it? That storm is awful pretty unless you're down in the middle of it. It's hard to see the beauty when you're in the middle of chaos. But you know what? That's something we need to learn to do. Uh, we all long for equilibrium. We want things to be past 
uh, passive. We want things to be quiet. We want things to be relaxing. But you know what? Equilibrium in physics is where every force is canceled out by another force. Another word for that is stagnation. Margaret Wheatley in her beautiful book, Leadership and the New Science, says, disequilibrium is an essential condition for you to grow. And there's a, a huge lesson there for cultural transformation because it is this disequilibrium. If you're going to change, if you're going to transform your culture, it's going to require some disequilibrium. It's going to require, on occasion, feeling like chaos. And your attitude has got to be that we're willing to accept that short-term chaos because if we don't, our culture becomes brittle and eventually we're like, is the real paradox, we're likely to succumb to major, massive chaos. You want a good example, one we'll look at in a future webinar. Look at what's happening to the Postal Service today. I happen to think the Postal Service is an outstanding organization. With 99 plus percent accuracy, they will get your first class letter anywhere you want to send it. But the culture of the Postal Service is brittle. It's, it's um, not adapting to what's happening in the world of email. And the only thing keeping the Postal Service afloat today is junk mail. And once that starts going away, and it will, the Postal Service, either they have to change their culture or something's going to break. That's got to be our attitude. Did you see this guy? That's Felix Baumgartner. He flew a balloon up 24 miles above the surface of the earth, and then he jumped out. <laughs> he was going 830 miles an hour as he headed toward the earth. He broke the sound barrier. And, you know, that's got to be our attitude. Whoopee, this is fun. It can be terrifying, but it can also be fun. Because, ladies and gentlemen, this is the world you're in. You are in, I don't care what industry you're in, you are in class five rapids, and this is you in that little boat. And you need to have everybody at the oars. You need to be an engaged person. You cannot afford to have people like this in today's world because this storm will not pass, and you can't just wait it out. Something we hear over and over at Values Coast. Well, you will come, you will go. This new CEO will come, he'll go. That's not going to happen. So let's put things into perspective. We hear this word crisis over and over, don't we? The health care crisis, the obesity crisis, the education crisis, the economic crisis, the debt crisis, the environmental crisis. When did the crisis begin? And it goes back to the beginning of this country. We've always had some sort of crisis or another going on. When will it, when will it all end? You know the answer to that. So rather than whining and complaining about how hard it is in whatever industry we're in, why don't we buck up and just deal with it? Is it the best of times or the worst of times? And you know the answer to that. The answer is yes. What do you choose to see? This is the Chinese symbol for crisis. It has two ideograms. One means danger. The other means opportunity. And we certainly have both today. So let's talk about a culture of ownership. It is created by and it creates engaged employees. It's a virtual cycle once you get onto it. Jim Owens, who used to run Caterpillar, said, if you want if you're competing on a global stage, and and I'll tell you, if you're on this webinar, you are, whether you know it or not, the first thing you've got to have to win is a highly engaged workforce. Scarlet Surveys defines employee engagement. And look at that highlighted word as positive or negative emotional attachment to the job, to your colleagues, and to your organization. And it profoundly influences your willingness to learn and to do a great job at work. It is emotional work. It is right brain work. That's why we spend so much time at Values Coach focusing on right brain, the interior design of emotional attitude, the culture of the organization. That's all right brain stuff. Here's my definition. Engagement is the key difference between a great or a mediocre or mediocre organization. It's not strategy. It's not the products. It's not the services. You've got to get all that right. But if you're going to be a great organization, you've got to have a great culture and you've got to have a highly engaged workforce. And at a personal level, whether or not you are engaged in your work is the difference between a mediocre career and a great career and a mediocre life and a great life.
And unfortunately, everybody who studies employee engagement comes up with pretty much the same findings. Only one in four people is really engaged in their work. 60% of us are not engaged. Now, that doesn't mean we're not doing a good job. I mean, we may be doing a good job technically, but we're not engaged in the work. All it is is the job. And about 15% of people are aggressively disengaged. Now, there's a huge range, of course. At a company like Southwest Airlines, it's probably close to 99% of people engaged because if you're not, you don't last. And then there's some organizations where it's probably 90 plus percent disengaged. The Detroit Auto Companies back in the 70s met that criteria. And imagine a, a big galley ship like this where only 25% of the people are really working hard and 60% of the people are just slapping at the water with the oars and 15% are actually rowing backwards. That would be a pretty dysfunctional boat, but that is the typical organization today. We call those highly engaged people spark plugs because that's what they do. They add a spark to an organization and to their own lives, by the way. And those disengaged people just going through the motions, doing the job, another day, another dollar. Those are the zombies, the people. Uh, you know, you ever hop in your car to drive somewhere and wonder how you got there? You were on autopilot. That's how they go through their days. Another day, another dollar. And then you have the vampires, the people who suck the life out of an organization and the people around them. By the way, you know how you recognize the vampires in an organization? You walk in the break room and there they are, hanging from the ceiling, waiting to pounce on their next victim and tell them how awful everything is. And you know who they most want to pounce on? The new employees. They want to get to the new employees and tell them how bad everything is before you have a chance to convince them how good things are. And you know what? It is going to get ugly. Um, there, there have been predictions for the last 15, 20 years. Demographers have been telling us we are headed into um, what Roger Herman in the subtitle of his book, Impending Crisis, said, too many jobs chasing too few people. And the only thing that has delayed that is the recession, which has prevented a lot of baby boomers from retiring when they wanted to. And Jim, Jim Clifton is the chairman of Gallup, and he wrote this book, which you ought to read, The Coming Jobs War. And what he said is, actively disengaged people want to undo everything that the engaged people do. Innovation, problem solving, creating and serving customers, they don't want that to happen. He says that actively disengaged people are a defect in the organization. The disengaged nurse is a defect every bit as much as giving the patient the wrong medication, partly because it is more likely that a disengaged person will give the wrong medication. A disengaged manager is a defect because disengaged managers do not optimize customer service, productivity, profitability, and everything else that's important to your organization. And he says, if we would just double the number of people engaged in their work from 25 to 50 percent, it would eliminate every problem in this country. It would do more than trillions of dollars of bailout money of new federal programs. It would do more than anything else to solve the problems of this country. And I think he's right. And if he's right about that, imagine what doubling the number of spark plug people in your organization would do to customer service, to employee engagement, to customer satisfaction, patient satisfaction if you're a hospital, productivity and profitability. It would be a quantum leap because disengagement has a negative impact on everything. It affects quality. For one thing, disengaged people don't go home at the end of the day and read professional journals on how to be better in their jobs. They go home and watch reality TV. Oh, is that what life's all about? It affects safety. The number one cause of accidents is carelessness. Carelessness is caused by not paying attention. Not paying attention is something that disengaged people do. It affects, obviously, customer satisfaction. You cannot be a negative, bitter, cynical, sarcastic, pickle sucker, whining, complaining, and gossiping in the break room, and then go out and, and deal with a customer or deal with a patient in a way that is genuinely, authentically passionate, and customers and patients see right through that fraud. It obviously affects productivity. Disengaged people don't work as hard. They don't work as productively. They don't work as long. 
because <laughs> half of their day they're spent whining, complaining, and gossiping. It affects your marketing image. You can spend a ton of money on billboards and, and magazine ads, and all it takes is for one employee to be overheard at the grocery store saying, well, I'd never let my family go there for health care. I'd never buy their products. I don't buy their services. And it wipes it all out. And paradoxically, ironically, if all those things happen, your sales go down, your, your uh, customers go away, and job security, the thing that the zombies and vampires are most worried about and complain most about, goes away. But the real tragedy of disengagement is the impact on the disengaged person, him or herself. It's life diminishing to go through 8 hours or 10 or 12 hours of your day on autopilot, or worse yet, whining about how bad it is where you work. Edward Hallowell is a psychiatrist, um, and he, by the way, he's written the best books I've ever read on ADD and on worry, and he wrote an article in the Harvard Business Review about disengagement, and he said it's the leading cause of people not achieving their own personal and professional goals, and you know that's true, don't you? Think about it. The most negative people at work, they're also the people who they're over their head in debt. Their lives aren't working. Their relationships aren't working. And he said it's a leading cause of depression. The number one medication being prescribed by your employee health program for your employees, I guarantee you, is antidepressants. And what Hallowell is saying is if people would just get up in the morning and, you know, Les Brown is a motivational speaker. And he says, every morning I get up, I look around my body, and if I don't see a chalk line, I know it's going to be a great day. <laughs> and just think, if we all had that attitude about our work, if we're alive and we're here, it's a great day, let's get great things done, we would be spending a lot less money on antidepressants. Gallup says this, disengaged people, they're unhappy in their work, they don't trust management, they don't have positive relationships, they don't have pride in what they do, they don't have respect for the organization where they work. Engaged people like where they work. They tend to trust management. They tend to be happy in their work. They tend to have positive relationships. And that raises the question, which is the chicken and which is the egg? Are people disengaged because their workplace sucks? Or do they think the workplace sucks because they're disengaged? And if you have a lot of disengaged people, the danger is you start circling the drain. Because if I'm a positive, can-do, optimistic, cheerful kind of person, and I, I somehow get sucked into working with your organization that's full of toxic vampires and pickle suckers, I'm not going to stay long. You're going to push me away. You're going to push me away if I'm a customer or a patient or a client, and you begin circling the drain. That's a pretty powerful metaphor, isn't it? If this is what your organization feels like to work in, to be served by, to buy products from, to be taken care of, if you're in healthcare, you are in trouble. Gilbert disease is the epidemic of America. You know, Scott Adams is, is brilliant and his cartoons are sometimes funny, but Dilbert does, you know, Dilbert's a very sick man. He hates his job, despises his coworkers, and yet his biggest fear is losing the job that he hates. And, and that's the syndrome that, that will be deadly in any organization. And your challenge as an organization is to shift what we call the attitude bell curve to the right. You want to have more spark plugs. You want to honor and encourage those spark plugs. You want to wake up the zombies, get them to become spark plugs, and those vampire people who suck the life out of your organization, your challenge is either to spark them, and you know, sometimes in our work, we see pretty miraculous things. When people who are toxic and negative realize it's because they're miserable that people see them as vampires, as pickle suckers, and they do the hard work to change their lives, and it's a miraculous thing. You'll see an example in a minute. One of the tools that we share with people is this passion performance matrix. If you're on the left side, you're in trouble, and you don't want people, passionate people who do a terrible job or dispassionate people who do a terrible job, they need work. You need to work on them, and some of them you need to encourage to go work for the competition. Where you want people to be is in that upper right quadrant where they're 
capable, competent, and passionate about their work. And too many people are in that lower left-hand quadrant. We call it the Sarah Rutledge quadrant because in the book, The Florence Prescription, Sarah Rutledge is a nurse who's got excellent clinical skills but a toxic negative attitude. And there are too many people who think, well, my attitude doesn't matter as long as I do the job. And attitude is everything. Attitude does matter. Let me introduce you to C.C. Peters, the woman in the middle there. She is a nurse at Fairfield Medical Center in Lancaster, Ohio. And when she read that book, The Florence Prescription, she said, oh my God, is that what people see when they look at me? And she realized that that was the case. She is an excellent clinical labor and delivery nurse. She's the nurse you want to have in the room in a tough delivery. But back then, you didn't want to be around her other times because she was always complaining and whining. And she made the commitment to make the change. And she is here in this picture surrounded by her chief nursing officer, Cynthia Pearsall, and her CEO, Mina Eubing. Um, and they're celebrating the fact that she has moved from that lower left quadrant to the upper right quadrant. And by the way, you're going to see her again in a minute. So don't forget C.C. Peters. One of the tools in the toolkit is is a survey that you can give to people. And I'll ask you to, it's not, I'm not going to show it to you, but I'm going to ask you to read it. But here's a question. The, the sample that's in the toolkit, the average response for all of their questions was 3.39 on a 5.0 scale. And I'm not going to tell you what, what that organization was, but I am going to tell you that I consider it to be one of the greatest organizations we've worked with. A lot of wonderful people. They do a lot of great job. They have a very high respect level in the community, but their own self-assessment was 3.4 on a 5.0 scale. Would you be okay with that? And I'll tell you, the organization we worked with was not okay with that. And they felt like they had to do work to change their culture. And then one of the questions on that survey is this, or it's a comment. Our people reflect positive attitudes, treat others with respect, and refrain from complaining, gossiping, or pointing fingers. And again, this very positive organization, this organization that does great work, had a 2.75 on a 5.0 scale. Would you be okay with that in your organization? And I hope your answer is no. But I suspect that if you were honest with yourself, your answer would be, yep, that's about where we are, which is why we have this toolkit. And I want to say a special word to you if you're a manager or a supervisor at any level of your organization. You are being paid to set a positive example and be part of the solution. You are not being paid. In fact, you are not doing your job. In fact, in my opinion, it's an unethical thing for you to accept the paycheck of being a manager or a supervisor, but to set an example of complaining, gossiping, seeing the negative, being a pessimist, and being part of the problem. When you accept that job title and that paycheck of being a manager, you have given up certain freedoms, and those are the freedoms you've given up. And if you're not willing to give them up, you have, I believe, an ethical responsibility to step down from that role and let somebody who is positive and optimistic do that job. And so here's the next question for you. That attitude bell curve I mentioned, would the profile be the same for your middle management group? And if so, you have a big problem because management ought to have a bell curve substantially shifted to the right. You ought to have in management a whole lot more spark plugs and zero vampires. And the zombies, your, your job is to wake them up. And worse yet, do you have a culture that tolerates managers who are little mini the Donalds with the you're fired thing? It is a travesty that he is being held out as a role model of leadership to our young people because that style of leadership is dead, dead, and gone. If your name isn't on the door like his name is at Trump, um, this style of management will cause you to fail and fail fast in any other organization. And Stanford professor Bob Sutton has a rule for people like that and organizations like that. And that's the rule. And if, if you have a culture that tolerates this kind of behavior, you have work to do. And I don't care if it's a manager, a surgeon in the operating room. If, if your culture tolerates jerks, you need to change that. And what Sutton says in this book is that 
once you do, once you become intolerant to those people, even if it means sending them out of the organization, even if they're a superstar, everybody else's performance raises more than enough to offset whatever loss you have suffered. This is Jim Kiltz. Jim Kiltz was made CEO of Gillette at a time when that company was going down the tubes. And one day he got all of his managers together in a great big conference room and he said, I have two questions. Question number one, do you think this company has a financial crisis? Every hand went up because they all knew the company's in big trouble. Okay, he said, question number two, do you have a financial crisis in your department? About half the hands went up. He said, okay, I'm going to call a break. After the break, I'm going to call you back. I'm going to ask you that question again. If your hand doesn't go up, it will be your last day with this company. And the message he was sending is if you're not part of the solution, if you're part of the problem. If you think it's just somebody else's problem, I don't want you on this boat. I don't want you on this bus. Get on board. Let's take a minute and talk about neurobiology of corporate culture. There's a whole new understanding of how the brain works, and we'll talk about it more in the mod module on the uh, emotional attitude in the workplace about brain plasticity and psychoneuroimmunology and how the brain works and why that's so important. But that's also a great metaphor for the 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 um, the neural connections within the culture of your organization, for the mind of your organization, if you will. And you know, there's this uh, dichotomy, the left brain, right brain. Left brain is the logical, rational, linear thinker, if A, then B, the bean counter. Right brain is the emotional, the creative. Right brain is the poet. Now, management is left brain. That is running the business. And you've got to have effective management. That's a given. If you don't, you're in trouble. But leadership is of the right brain. It's more poetic than it is a spreadsheet. And in today's world, we need leaders in every corner, not just in the corner office. So let's look a little bit further at this right brain, left brain dichotomy. Left brain is transactional. Right brain is transformational. James McGregor Burns wrote a Pulitzer Prize winning book called Leadership, and he described the difference. Transactional leadership runs the business. You give someone a paycheck, they give you time. They give you money, you give them a product or a service. That's a, you got to do a good job at that. Transformational leadership is changing people. The way Habitat for Humanity or Teach for America or Southwest Airlines, the way they change people who are part of the organization. Left brain is rules. Right brain is values. When people buy into a common set of values, you don't need to have a lot of rules telling them what to do because they know how to act. They know how to make decisions. They know how to deal with conflict because it's based on their values. Left brain is process. Right brain is attitude. If all you do is work on streamlining your process without working on helping people have a more positive attitude, all you're doing is speeding up the assembly line. Left brain creates plans. Every organization has a strategic plan. But it's right brain that inspires people to take ownership for their part of their plan. David Meister is a big time consultant. He wrote the book Strategy and the Fat Smoker. He says, we all know what the strategy is. And it's true, don't we? Quit smoking and lose weight. We all know that. The problem is inspiring people to take ownership because they know the strategies. Serve your customers well. Do a great job. Be productive. Be cost effective. We know what the strategies are. We've got to be inspired to follow the strategies. You can measure left brain, but you can't see it. What would the bottom line look like if it walked in the room right now? That's a silly question. You cannot see, or I'm sorry, you cannot measure attitude, but you can certainly see it. And so one of the things we need to do is think creatively about new ways to assess the things that cannot be measured. Left brain is a given. Right brain is a choice. When I got up this morning, I could not make the decision, I think today I'll be an accountant. <laughs> that left brain stuff takes a lot of training. Right brain, though, I did make a choice. Am I going to have a good day or a bad day? What's my attitude going to be? That is a choice. I made a choice this morning. I'll make that choice all day long. So will you. Left brain is inert. You cannot catch accounting. <laughs> I've tried. 
Right brain is more contagious than flu bug in a kindergarten class. One toxic negative person walking into a room, it's the, the emotional equivalent of somebody lighting a cigarette and polluting the air and everybody feels it. Left brain is what you do, right brain is who you are. If I move into a new community and I need an insurance agent, I'll go to Google or the Yellow Pages, talk to a neighbor, and I'll go to your agency because you happen to sell insurance. But I will not be with you three or four years from now if I don't know, like, trust, and respect you. In other words, I will come to you because of what you do. I will stay with you because of who you are. And finally, you show me an organization that is all left brain and I will show you boring. Show me a place that is all right brain, <laughs> I'll show you chaos. And the challenge is, how do we integrate the two? Left brain is the bean counter. Left brain counts the beans and God bless the bean counters. We all need to have people who keep us financially on track. But this is the danger. You could have this sort of attitude. Our employees are our greatest asset. I say we sell them. That's what accountants do to an asset. They depreciate it and then they write it off and sell it or throw it away. So for one thing, stop saying your employees are your greatest asset um, because they're not. They are a resource to be invested in, not an asset to be depreciated. And it's right brain that creates beans. And you need to have right brain people. So here's a very practical example of how it works. You, we hear the word recruiting and retention as if it's just one word. But they're two different motivational approaches. We call it the honey and glue uh, formula. You recruit people with honey. Pay and benefits, uh, do I get a corner office, what are the opportunities for advancement, all of those measurable left brain stuff, that's how you recruit people, but that's not why they stay or why they leave, it's because of right brain qualities. Do you make me feel special? Do I feel like I'm part of something important? Do I like my boss? Do I like the people I work with? Am I proud to be part of this organization? All, that's all that right brain culture stuff that we're talking about. And it's not accountability or ownership, left brain or right brain. It's how do we create a whole brain culture. Most organizations are overbalanced on the left side and that's why we work on the right side. And that will be a consistent theme throughout all six of our modules and all of our work together is this interaction between culture and strategy. The interaction between left brain and right brain. And it's this journey from mere accountability which is important but not enough to a culture of ownership. The word accountable, if you break it down, it means able to be counted. Accountability is doing what you're supposed to do because somebody else is looking over your shoulder. It's in the job description. It is extrinsic motivation, reward and punishment. And as the ultimate numbers guy, the TQM guru Deming said, the most important number in your organization cannot be counted. You cannot hold people accountable for the things that really matter. How do you hold somebody accountable for pride, for caring, for enthusiasm, for passion? You can't hold people accountable for those things. You can make them salute, but you can't make them laugh. Nobody ever checks the oil in a rental car, do they? We return it full of gas because it's in the contract, but we don't wash it and wax it. We don't check the oil because there's no pride of ownership. And so here's a question for you. Do your people own their work or are they just renting a spot on the organization chart? Anytime you see somebody walk down the hall of your organization and not stoop down to pick up a piece of paper because I don't do housekeeping, that's not my job. Uh, not stop to help a patient who's in obvious distress. Not go out of their way to help a customer because that's not my customer, that's not my area. That person is just renting a spot on the organization chart. And what happens is your, your HR department ends up looking like this. We have jobs for rent. Um, we're not looking for owners, we're looking for renters. And you won't, they won't admit that, but that's, if you have a high turnover rate, that may be, probably is, your problem. Ownership is doing what needs to be done, whether or not it's in your job description, because you have that pride that you expect it of yourself. Um, it is intrinsic motivation. You don't need somebody holding your feet to the fire. You're, you, ha you have a fire within that inspires you 
to do that work. In a culture of ownership, people see their job description not as a ceiling, a limit on what I can do, not my job, but as a floor. It's a platform. And then they go out of their way to do other things that make their work special. And I'll give you a real world example. I was recently on the phone with my friend Jim Giordano. He's the CEO of CareTech Solutions. It's an IT company that serves hospitals. And I asked him, what are your core values? And I asked this question of a lot of people. Most people can't tell me. He could from memory. He said, we have three of them. And he recited this pretty much verbatim from memory. And at the top, you notice those words, whatever it takes. And notice the IT is in caps. And so that sort of play on words. He said, I'll give you an example. One of the hospitals that we work with, that we serve, um, somebody inadvertently threw away three laptops. And our guys went to the city dump, put on hazmat uniforms, and went through the garbage looking for the laptops. They finally, it was 90 degrees that day, by the way. It stunk to high heaven. They finally found them. One of the laptops had been crushed, and the hard drive was ejected. Now, these laptops have sensitive patient information on them. They went through the trash until they found that hard drive the size of a cell phone. That is going above and beyond. That is, see, that is owning the work and not just renting the job. Another friend of mine, Jim Autry, is a, an author and a consultant and a speaker. Um, but he was an, an executive at Meredith, a big publishing company. And in one of his books, he said this, I had to fire people who love their jobs, but I never had to fire anybody who loved the work. It's like the poet McZen said, someone with a job is never secure. Someone with a calling is never unemployed. And when we talk, let's be clear, when we talk about ownership, we're not talking about financial ownership. Um, this is Alex Spector. He recently retired as director of the Alaska VA Healthcare System. We worked with them for many years. They built a brand new facility. And he put up this certificate of ownership and invited all of his employees to sign it as a way of taking ownership for their work, their clinic, the veterans that they serve. Nobody, own, well, actually, you and I own the VA because we're taxpayers. But you can't buy stock in the VA. There, He was asking people to take emotional ownership. Nobody ever walked off the job at a Habitat project in a pay dispute. Why? They're not being paid. But imagine how much better your organization would be if people brought that sort of passion that they give, give without being paid to a Habitat project to the day job where they are being paid. So let's talk about building a culture of ownership. Jim Collins, who wrote Good to Great and Built to Last and most re recently Great by Choice, he said you got to start by having the right people on the bus. And I disagree. For one, I, I agree with most of what he says, but not that. For one thing, you can't just choose who you have on the bus. If you have 20 or 200 or 2,000 or 20,000 employees, you can't just choose who you're going to have on the bus. Uh, Joyce writes a letter to God. Thank you for the baby brother, but what I prayed for was a puppy. <laughs> and sometimes you get baby brothers. And you can't just throw the wrong, wrong quote, unquote, people off the bus. Please send Dennis Clark to a different camp this year. You know what? Unless you do something different, Dennis is going to show up again tomorrow. What you can do, and I think your challenge before you start thinking about who to get on and throw off the bus, is to look at the bus itself. Is this a bus that, we're, that people would be proud to be a part of? Uh, and if not, how can we make it that kind of a bus? And you do that by creating a culture of ownership. So we're going to share in the toolkit many tools with you. And I just want to do a, uh, we're going to cover this one later. Um, in another webinar. But th this is an example of the kind of tools that you can use to think about the kind of bus you have. Um, and it, it's, uh, it's a mapping tool. So it, it talks about the why, the what, and the how of having a culture of ownership. Um, so why do you want to have a culture? That inner circle talks about some of the benefits. You, uh, you'll be more resilient to change. Uh, you'll be more innovative because people are thinking about how to be better. You'll have higher loyalty. Um, so what do you have to do to do that? That's the next ring. And any one of those things on that next ring, passion, initiative, fellowship, will increase loyalty. What this tool does is it forces you, it challenges you to pick one so you can work on it. So you say, well, we want to, we want to make people more proud to be a part of our organization. So you go to, how do we do that? That outer ring. And 
Again, any one of the boxes in that outer ring, hiring and training and evaluating for attitude, uh, connecting people to the personal mission, uh, self-empowerment. But we're going to, and what we do at Values Coach, is we're going to help people connect their personal values and the values of the organization. And this is the kind of thinking, the kind of disciplined thinking, ironically enough, left brain thinking to create a right brain culture that you need to do to create a, a blueprint, a plan for your culture. So in, in uh, the next webinar, we're going to talk about uh, culture. And, and two webinars down, we're going to get even more into that superstructure of corporate culture. But right now, let's just do a quick recap. What does it take? And I'll, I'll challenge you to think about where you are on all of these eight. What does it take to create a culture of ownership? And in the book, The Florence Prescription, I described eight essential qualities for a culture of ownership. And Fairfield Medical Center, where C.C. Peters works, um, actually took those eight qualities and, and created what they call their employment brand. So they're using those eight qualities to recruit new people. They're using them to help promote the kind of culture they want to have internally. And let's do a quick review. Um, the first is commitment. When you have a culture of ownership, people are committed through good times and bad. They're committed to the values, the vision, the purpose of your organization. They're engaged with their patients, with their customers, with coworkers. They're engaged with the work itself. They get up in the morning, look around, and don't see a chalk line and know it's going to be a great day. They're passionate about their work. They bring enthusiasm, a positive attitude, optimism, and joy. And take a look at who is on this poster. That is C.C. Peters, the woman who at one time was a poster child for pickles, who looked like she had a pickle stuck in her mouth because she had such a negative attitude. And when they were doing that, she said, I want to be the poster child for passion. And what do you call that? I would call that a miracle. And if you can bring about that kind of change in the attitudes of some of your people, you don't have to throw them off the bus. They will become the people helping you drive the bus. In a culture of ownership, you would see people taking initiative. The most important three words in the Florence Prescription book, and I always sign the book with these three words, proceed until apprehended. Don't allow learned helplessness or excuses or a feeling of disempowerment to stop you from doing the right thing. In a culture of ownership, you would see a spirit of fellowship. A lot of my volunteer work is with support groups. And you know, something I've noticed is that nobody ever leaves a support group meeting worse than they came in. At the end of the evening, they still have cancer. They're still an addict. What they have lost is not coming back to them, but they have a new friend, a little more hope, a little more courage, a little more inspiration. They are somehow better for the experience of the evening. And I've often wondered, why can't the workplace be like that? At the end of the day, why can't we go home physically tired because we've been working hard, but emotionally and spiritually uplifted because of the supportive fellowship that we've had where we work. And finally, in a culture of ownership, you would see pride in the organization, the profession, and the work itself. And it all starts with a shared vision. And that's what I'm challenging you and your team to work on between now and the next webinar, the next module, is what sort of culture do you really want to have? What, what is the invisible architecture you want to work on? Your values, your culture, the attitudes in the workplace. What is your big why? Gary Keller is the founder of Keller Williams Realty, fastest growing real estate and as of last year, biggest real estate company in America. And in his book, um, he talks about the big why. He says it's not enough just to want to make a lot of money to you know make a living, save for retirement. You've got to have something bigger than that. And that's the, that big why. That's what I'm asking you. What is the why? What is the vision for making that big why become your reality? And one of the tools that we share is creating a memory of the future. And I'm going to wrap up with that. There are six steps for creating a memory of the future. And I absolutely believe you can remember the future more clearly, more accurately than you can remember the past. And here's a simple proof for that. You cannot remember, I'm sure, your second birthday, uh, even though you know it happened. But you can create a very clear picture of where you're going to be this time tomorrow, what you're doing, what you're wearing, who you're with. <laughs> Isn't that funny? 
You can remember tomorrow more clearly and accurately than you can remember your second birthday. And, and why is that? Because tomorrow is going to be a lot like yesterday. And part of the secret of being successful as in your career, uh, in achieving your goals, in your organization, is the ability to remember a tomorrow that is somehow different than yesterday. And not just tomorrow, but next week, next month, next year. And so let's look at the six A's. First is aspiration. You gotta want it. If you, if you're perfectly content with the way things are, or worse yet, if you're totally complacent and you're not happy with it, but you're not willing to do any work, um, you're not gonna get anywhere. You have to have some level of ambition. Ambition created the cities, the churches, the schools and universities, the hospitals, uh, technology. That's all because people aspired to something more. This is a picture of Columbus Regional Hospital in Indiana the, the day after they were uh, shut down by a flash flood. I happened to site visit that hospital for a leadership um, award they were nominated for and won. And their vision statement is to be the best in the world at everything we do. And I read that and I thought, well, there's a bunch of hype. So I was talking to the CEO, Jim Bickle, and I said, tell me. <laughs> Tell me about this vision statement. And he said, well, don't get us wrong. We're not going to do everything. But if we commit to doing something, we will benchmark and we will strive to be the best in the world at what we do. And as I walked around that hospital and talked to people, I was, it was amazing because everybody bought into that vision. The housekeepers knew Ritz-Carlton is the best in the world. In food service, they knew Mrs. Fields makes the best chocolate chip cookies in the world, and that's who they were benchmarking with. That is aspiration at a personal and at an organizational level. The second A is articulation. You need to be able to describe that dream in a way that people can see it. And one of the best examples in the history of business is this cocktail napkin. Herb Kelleher and Roland King were sitting in a bar in Dallas one night complaining that to get from Dallas to Houston, they had to fly through Kansas City. And Roland King said, well, why don't we start an airline that just goes in state from one city to another? And Herb Kelleher said, Roland, that's a crazy idea. Let's do it. And that was and is the business plan for Southwest Airlines, something that anybody could cap, capture and understand. The third is you need to reinforce the dream, the vision with affirmation because we dream in pictures and they're beautiful, but then we start worrying in words. You know, your dream is the beautiful new house and in the back of your head you hear, well, you can't afford the mortgage you have now. How are you going to pay for that monstrosity? Um, and so you need to have various ways of affirming yourself. This is a bulletin board at Alverno Clinical Laboratories in Indiana. And they have taken each of the promises of the self-empowerment pledge and the Never Fear, Never Quit poster and put them up on their bulletin board as a daily constant reminder to take those promises to heart. It's, a, it's an ongoing affirmation. And you have to be willing to ask for help. Canfield and Hansen wrote this book, The Aladdin Factor. And they said, if you ask the right question of the right person at the right time, the answer is always going to be yes. And I'll give you an example of a sort of out-of-the-box um, asking people to get involved, to get on the bus. In Wyoming, there are two critical access hospitals on either side of the state, Star Valley Medical Center in Afton and Memorial Hospital of Converse County in Douglas. And they have challenged each other to do a great job on values and culture. And we're, we are orchestrating that at Values Coach. We're calling it the Great Wyoming Values and Culture Challenge. And what, what a fun thing, because they've gone to their people, and instead of saying, you got to shape up, they're saying, hey, we've got this fun competition. Let's see who can have the best plan for culture. Let's see who can get the most people involved. Let's see who can have the best results on improving employee engagement and patient satisfaction and all of these things. And yet, next, you have to take action. Um, without action, it's just wishful thinking. Uh, one of the things that we've seen happen in Nebraska, we have the Values Collaborative going. And we now have more than 20 of the state's 85 hospitals engaged in the Values, and that's just in two years, in the Values Collaborative. And, and we're training people to be certified values trainers, more than 170 people so far. And what these 20 hospitals have understood is culture doesn't change spontaneously. You can't just wish it. You have to take action, and you have to have people 
who are trained and prepared and committed to take action. And that's what these certified values trainers do. And by the way, I hope that you, uh, that one of the outcomes of this toolkit will be that you'll talk to us about how you can be engaged in the values collaborative. And finally, the world's going to change, you're going to change, you have to be willing to adapt the vision. And sometimes it means adapt the vision upward. You know, when Herb Kelleher and Roland King sat in that bar and said, that's a crazy idea, let's do it, they probably didn't foresee that 30 years later they would have the biggest airline in America. But they, they saw the vision and then they continued to adapt as the situations changed and as they grew. Every year I do a workshop at Grand Canyon. And I hope someday some of you will come join me. We do two days in a classroom, and then one day we hike along the eight-mile rim trail. And I give everybody a T-shirt. And the front is blank, and on the back it says this, define your future by your dreams and not by your memories. How many people do you know, and maybe it's you, who are held back by dreadful memories of the past, of self-limiting assumptions, self-limiting beliefs caused by things that happened in the past, and by your hopes and not by your fears? Again, how many people are standing in a cage with no lock on the door because they don't have the courage to open the door and walk out. And so that's what it says on the back of the t-shirt. And then on the front we ask people, draw a picture of a dream, something that's important to you. And then wear that as a constant reminder that you're, it's not just a hope, wish, or a dream, it's a memory of the future. And, and I'll tell you about one guy. He drew a picture of a farm, you know, the red barn, the green John Deere tractor, and he said, this, this is the family farm. Been in our family for over a 100 years. But my dad just passed away. My brothers don't want a farm. And I'm afraid I can't keep the farm in the family. And that's my dream. And so I said, look, every day uh, you put on that T-shirt for a year. Wash it every now and then. And when you put it on, you say five times, like you really mean it, the family farm stays in the family. The family farm stays in the family. And then every single day, Monday through Friday, you do at least two things. And they could be very small. It doesn't matter. Two things to keep the family farm in the family. Instead of going to Starbucks, you put $4 in a coffee can for the, the down payment, and you, you drink Folgers. Um, you call one more bank. You talk to one more person about buying 40 acres so you can keep the 1,500 acres. Every day you do two things. You know what? A little over a year later, I got a call from this man. He was very emotional. He had just left the bank where he had signed the papers to keep the family farm in the family. He had to sell some of it, but he kept his dream alive. He kept the farm in the family. And I asked him, I said, had you not painted the picture on that t-shirt and worn it and done those things, would it still be? He said, absolutely not. He said, that was the catalyst that galvanized me to take action to create my memory of the future. When you have a memory of the future, it creates healthy cognitive dissonance. Now, cognitive dissonance in its unhealthy form is mental illness. It's trying to hold two incompatible thoughts simultaneously. And one of the things that we'll share a number of times throughout this course is how do you use that both personally and organizationally in a positive way? You know, if, if this is you, you live in a, a trailer park, you know, Jeff Foxworthy's definition of a redneck, the house has wheels and the car doesn't, and that's where you live, but your dream is this beautiful home, a log home in the mountains with a car out front, you have cognitive dissonance. And at, at that point, one of two things, one of three things has to happen. You could decide cognitive dissonance is okay. You'll just live with it. Um, or the dream dies. But if you don't let the dream die, you keep putting on the t-shirt, saying the affirmation, doing the work, you start thinking of all kinds of new ways, the way this young man with the farm did, of making that dream become your reality. So let's wrap up with some of the key lessons we've learned with our work with organizations across the country on how do you bring about cultural transformation. Lesson number one, launching a movement is a lot harder than doing another program. But if you want to achieve sustained success, if you really want to transform your culture, you're much more likely to do that if you're positioning as a movement that you want people to buy into heart and soul just not just to, for the patient or for the customer or for the boss, but because it's going to help them personally. And lesson 1B is 
you have to keep at it until you hit critical mass. Once 30% of a population really buys into something, you've hit critical mass, and there's a lot of research on this, and you, your success becomes more inevitable. In the workbook that goes with this toolkit, I actually describe lessons that we can learn from the anti-smoking movement, and it really was a movement. And you know what? We will never, ever go back to a, a, a day when people can smoke on airplanes. That, that is gone and dead forever. But we had to get to the point where enough of us said, I don't have to put up with this. Uh, you need enough people moving fast enough in your organization to escape the negative attitudes, the pessimism, that'll never work, the cynicism, you know, we tried that before, the inertia, you've got to get enough people moving fast enough to hit critical mass to start your movement. Lesson number two, you've got to have top-down support and direction from your leadership and the management group, but you also have to have bottom-up passion and innovation, people at every level. You know, one of the things I'll share later is the pickle challenge. This pickle has taken on a life of its own. We're seeing singing pickles, dancing pickles. People are doing things with this pickle promise to turn complaints into blessings I never would have thought of, and that's bottom-up passion. Lesson 2B. People have to believe that senior top leadership is committed to it. That's why we encourage the executive team to show up every day if you're in town for the reading of the Promise from the Self-Empowerment Pledge. And this one might well be most important. Uh, the one thing we look at when we start working with an organization is middle management. And if, if they're, oh God, another program, we know that we're swimming against a strong current. But if their attitude is, this is going to be fun, this is exciting, wow, this is, this is not just you know, a routine program, then we know that we are uh, going with a fast current. Lesson three, embrace the skeptics. When you start something new, people are going to be skeptical, and they're going to ask good questions. Why are we doing this? How much is it going to cost? Why are we doing this instead of something else? Um, how do we know it's going to work? What if it doesn't work? Where else does it work? Um, those are good questions, and what we have found is when you start answering, honestly answering the skeptics' questions, even if the question is, we don't know, we'll have to figure it out, they become some of your best supporters. But you've got to marginalize the cynics. The cynic is the one who says, that'll never work. We tried that before, and it didn't work. It didn't work at my sister's place in Toledo. It won't work here. And, and then they do everything they can to make sure it doesn't work so they can say, I told you that wouldn't work. And you have to marginalize them and plow through resistance. Engage the potential critics. Figure out who are the people most in a position to stop you and try to get them on board early on to think like partners in the process. Lesson four, um, do not identify your effort to change your culture with a program. You're not doing Covey. You're not doing Disney. You're not doing Studer. You're not doing Values Coach. What you're doing is trying to create a more positive, productive culture that is going to help everybody who works there and the people you serve. And these are simply tools that you're using. And related to that, create what we call initiative coherence by showing how these various things you're doing relate to one another and relate to your ultimate goals. Lesson number five, one of the most important things you can do is establish rituals and routines. You know, the pickle challenge where people, you know, put a quarter in the jar every time they catch themselves complaining. The daily reading of the self-empowerment pledge, things we'll get to in the module on emotional attitude. Um, those things help you build that momentum and celebrate the successes. You know, when you see somebody like C.C. Peters start to make a change in her attitude and in the way she works, celebrate that. And then capture and share those stories. Lesson six, you've got to have this proceed until apprehended attitude. You're going to make mistakes. You're going to run into resistance. People are going to look at you like you're crazy because you're one of the lone nuts from that video. And you've got to proceed until apprehended. You've got to keep going. And one of the lessons we've learned in the Values Collaborative with our values trainers, in surgery residency they say, see one, do one, teach one. When someone goes through a course or listens to a webinar like what we're doing today, you're seeing one. Then hopefully you go out and you do something. You take the self-empowerment pledge to heart yourself. Um, you, you think about where do I fall on this passion performance matrix. You look at your department and say, where do we fall on this attitude bell curve and how do we shift 
the right. But if you really want to learn something, the very best way is to teach it. And that's what our certified values trainers are telling us, is that when they started sharing the course with other people is when they started internalizing it themselves. I have a poster in my office as a reminder to me. Every great accomplishment was at one time the impossible dream of somebody who simply refused to quit, no matter what resistance they ran into, no matter how many times they fell down. You're going to run into resistance. You're going to fall down. You're going to make mistakes. If you just don't quit, someday you will look back and say, wow, what a, what a journey we had. In the Florence Prescription book, it says, if we each do our part, we can change our lives for the better, the way C.C. Peters and hundreds of others have by thinking about their values, by thinking about the attitude that they bring to work. If we all do our parts, we'll change our organizations for the better, the way the hospitals and other organizations engaged in the Values Collaborative have done, the way I hope you will do by using this toolkit effectively. And in changing our organizations, we can change our world for the better. And that's really ultimately what it's all about, isn't it? So we have another five webinars coming up. Before you go to the next webinar, please take some time. Think about what we've talked about on this one. Go through that module in the workbook and get yourself ready for the next one. And the next webinar, I'll talk about the invisible architecture. And we'll go into more detail into that, that construction metaphor of values and culture and attitude. And then the three webinars after that, we dive even deeper. Um, the, the foundation of core values in your organization and the personal values. And I'll give you a quick recap of our course on the 12 core action values. And you'll have a link to the 400 page workbook if you want to, uh, and I hope you will, go deeper into that. Um, corporate culture, that superstructure that, of, that you put on top of that foundation of values, the personality, the character. We'll talk about how do you consciously shape that culture and not just let it spontaneously evolve. And then the interior finishing of the attitude in the workplace. How do you create the kind of environment that promotes a more positive attitude about work, about relationships? And those are things that you can do. And finally, the last webinar will wrap up and talk about leadership. Um, Management is a job description. Leadership is a life decision. And we need leadership today in every corner of every organization. And so what we'll talk about is the four dimensions of values-based leadership. Personal character, expectations of yourself and others, um, fellowship, creating that spirit of fellowship I talked about, and finally, quest. It's not just the day job. We're trying to do something that's really important that makes a difference. So I will look forward to seeing you at the next webinar. Uh, between now and then, if you need any help at all, please contact me, contact Michelle, Twee, Sally, anybody else in the Values Coach office, and we will do everything we can to help. And let me wrap up, as I often do in speaking, with my seven favorite words. Never fear. Doesn't mean don't be afraid. It means stand up to your fears and do what you have to do. Never quit. And it doesn't mean don't stop. If something's not working, by all means stop. It means don't give up. Keep hammering away until you hit critical mass and expect a miracle. Not a magic trick, but when you can bring about the kind of changes that people like C.C. Peters have experienced in their lives, when you can bring about changes in your organization, the kind of things that we hear from the CEOs of our Values Collaborative members, um, the word we often do here is miracle. Never fear. Never quit. Expect a miracle. And I'll see you next time.